As the prosecutor finished, she said, this is shocking, unthinkable. I believe there were other use, words used throughout trial. Unbelievable, obviously unbelievable, unthinkable, unfathomable. And the reason that's the case is because it was unforeseeable. No one expected this. No one could have expected this, including Mrs. Crumbly. And so this is my poster just showing beyond a reasonable doubt is guilty, but there's many, many other options. If you think it's likely, probable, possible, not likely, those are all not guilties. You have to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt. When you look back in hindsight, it is easy to say, this could have been different, that could have been different, this would have changed. And the other circumstance, the second one that makes a huge difference is when you get full context around the evidence that is being used. And in this case, the prosecutor has cherry picked little bits of evidence out of mountains of evidence to put in front of you with no context to explain what they're doing. The only judge, although Ms. McDonald mentioned she's been a judge and was a judge several times during her jury selection, the only judge in this courtroom that matters is Judge Matthews. And the only other people whose judgment matters are the 12 of you who will collectively decide this case. I will openly admit that I'm a lawyer who messes up I get thrown off when I'm surprised by something. I feel like I get overwhelmed when information is coming at me quickly. I say I'm sorry a lot. Evidently there's a TikTok channel of me saying I'm sorry through this whole trial. And all I'm saying is that I'm human. So during this trial, I have stood before you and shown you all my flaws, and I embrace them, and they are a part of what makes me human. And so has Jennifer Crumbly. She got on the stand and talked about every nook and cranny of her life, things no one else in the world knew, in her family, among her friends, and she wanted you to see the whole truth, the entire truth, and nothing but the truth on everything. I saw a meme about a week ago that said, I'm trying to be a mom, trying to get exercised, stay hydrated, get enough sleep, text everyone back, and not lose my shit. And I've gotta be honest, as a mom, a working mom on most days, I'm lucky if I'm fit for human contact. I'm lucky if I've taken a true shower and didn't just grab a handful of wipes and scrub off the best I can on my way running out the door, putting on <coughs> my makeup as I drive to court in my car. Because my life is not perfect and no one's is. And during this trial, you may have concluded that you don't like me, that you hate me. That's fine. I am just asking that your opinions about me as a person, and if you're one of the people who plans to make a TikTok about me, that you won't hold those opinions against Jennifer Crumbly and will judge Jennifer Crumbly's case based on the evidence about her and her family. Pretty early on, I realized I am Jennifer Crumbly and I could be here accused and sitting in her spot very easily. Now in my house, we don't have guns. I don't have guns, but I do have children. And actually, I have an oopsie baby, my fourth one. I did not want four in four years, but that's what I was blessed with. I say I'm abundantly blessed. And I have kids that seem to have no issues. And at the end of the day, they're good kids. They go to school. We have no discipline problems. We have arguments here and there, just like every family does. 
I have a son that wants to hang out with me very rarely, but I have no belief that any of my four children would ever harm anyone else. And while I don't have a gun, I have a large butcher block on my counter with big knives that I use when I cook, and I enjoy cooking. My son plays a lot of video games. My son's online talking to a bunch of people as he's playing a lot of video games. Even though he has a cell phone, I don't go through it and look at his messages every day. And as he gets older, I do know he's interested in girls. If he starts receiving nude pictures of a girl on the cell phone I own but let him use and gave him for his birthday when he turned 11, should I be held accountable for receiving child pornography if a girl sexts him over some inappropriate pictures? If my son decides he's going to send some pictures back and takes a new picture of his bits and pieces, that's a 20-year felony. Am I then responsible because he sent a picture of his penis over to some girl? So the first place the defense finds reasonable doubt is in the fact that the prosecution is so desperate to prosecute this case that they admitted a mountain of evidence that quite frankly was unnecessary. Now they say to you they needed to show you, they needed to prove the manner of death. We stipulated that four people died. We stipulated that it was the most horrific set of facts you could ever imagine. We stipulated that what happened to Molly Darnell and Christy Gibson Marshall was horrible. <laughs> but this prosecution putting that evidence on was designed to inflame you and make you emotional, strike your sympathy, and get you to hate Mrs. Crumbly. When Brian Maloche testified, another example came about where the prosecution had him testify that Mrs. Crumbly said to delete his messages, clear your cache. And I'm, th I'm so thankful that the rest of the world sent me emails that I don't know how to pronounce cache because now I do. And when Brian ended up seeing the messages before clear your cache and after clear your cache, he realized, oh, she wasn't asking me to delete messages. <laughs> she wanted me to refresh my web browser to see if the Facebook had actually deactivated. There's also no context around some of this little bits and pieces of useless evidence, like Jennifer Crumbly saying that her son was an oopsie baby. I call my son that, so what? Does that mean I hate my son? Does that mean I, w I would be okay if he went and killed a bunch of people and or if he committed suicide? No! Calling your child an oopsie baby was designed to try to make her look bad with no context. And part of what made me realize I could be in Mrs. Crumbly's shoes is I have sent my texts, I have sent texts to my husband saying, our daughter is a psycho today. On the way to school last week, she's crying. She doesn't have people to sit with at lunch. I texted him, she's a nutcase. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't have time for this. My other daughter is complaining about her lights flickering in her room. I texted my husband, this starts like, this sounds like a case. The start of a case. My husband works for my office. He's actually my office manager, so he knows about the case. He went in her room and figured out in five minutes, it's because when she flips her blow dryer on, one of our plugs makes the lights flicker. I also got texts one day. We have no food in our house. I am absolutely starving. You are the worst mother ever. And you know what I did? I ignored it. She was mad we didn't have the right kind of chicken ramen. When we have 80, not 85, I like the number 85, when we have four other flavors of ramen, and there's about 100 other things she can eat, and I knew she's not going to starve to death, but taken out of context, it makes me look like a neglectful mother. And when I'm driving home from court every day, I'm getting messages, will you at least call back? And I don't, because I know what they want is for me to run through the McDonald's drive through and bring everyone a Coke. I do stop and get myself a Coke, but I am not getting a round of drinks every day for everyone, and I've realized it's easier to not answer the phone. Next, they went to March 16th through 19th, 
which was broken up into a million exhibits that, quite frankly, were out of order, threw me off my game, helped create these beautiful Tic Tacs. These are all the Facebook messages between James and Jennifer. So when you look at those Facebook messages and consider, and this includes the photographs and the GPS stuff, that they're using this much compared to this much over the period between January 2021 and the shooting. This is a very little, little bits in time compared to the grand scheme of things. And while the officer testified and played games with me that he's not sure this is the best evidence against mother, you better believe if they had better evidence, they'd be up here showing stronger and better evidence. This is it, ladies and gentlemen. And what you would have to believe, and what I would believe, is that if the state had stronger evidence, they would have paraded it up and we would have been seeing a lot more of these. But instead, they were admitted, and you haven't heard the friend testify, you haven't heard any context about these, and all you can see, and, and really all the evidence shows, is that there's no reason to believe Mrs. Crumbly ever saw them. If you put my texts up there and showed every time I told my mom that one of my kids was acting depressed or weird, I guess my favorite word is moody these days, it would look like my kids were complete lunatics. I'm actually shocked Jennifer Crumbly doesn't have more texts about her son acting like a typical teenager. Trained professionals told Mrs. Crumbly her son was not a risk. And Mrs. Crumbly relied upon it. This school also failed to even really look at the situation and tell her about things from the year before. They made it very clear that he was not in any kind of discipline issue, which is shocking to me and was shocking to Mrs. Crumbly, considering he's off topic looking at bullets in school. He's looking at a video in school of some kind of violent pictures. And then he draws a gun on his math paper instead of doing the gun, the, instead of doing the math paper. These professionals testified about how common guns are at the school, so common, and this kind of blew me away, although I live out there, that students are known to go to the gun ranges often, that girls on homecoming wearing their short little party dresses they wear to the dance take photos before the dance holding their guns that kids go hunting on late start Wednesday before they go to school and the school has to give reminders to parents for people to leave their guns at home. So this school that obviously has a strong gun culture going on that sees a student looking at bullets, looking at a video game type thing with violence, and seeing a gun drawn on a paper that these school officials, knowing that community, that they didn't ask if he had a gun when they carried the backpack down. And this is a community that is so into guns, I can't even believe that these girls, I always look at those pictures on Facebook and think, oh my God, how short are those dresses? And these are girls showing their dresses with their guns in their hand. They know this is a gun community. Brian is a terrible witness. He said he had memory problems. And quite frankly, when he's testifying that he knows that the gun was in the car that day of the shooting, we all know no one thinks that's true. Mrs. Crumbly testified and explained the day the gun was in the car. Brian's just wrong. I would submit to the jury that Brian is just an idiot and has no clue. And that the truth is, he didn't know the details about where the shooter's friend went. He just knew he went away. But it's clear that Brian Maloch has been put on a mission, which is, you're coming into court, you've got some things hanging over your head, and we want you to take a position against Mrs. Crumbly. And I would submit to you that if you read the 77-page exhibit, 
that I got yesterday and went through in painstaking detail with you, you can see that Brian Maloche did not think of Mrs. Crumbly that way when he knew her and when he dealt with her. And he testified the only places he got new information about her that made him think differently about his answers were from law enforcement and were from the media. Giving him little bits of information is particularly dangerous because he's not the sharpest. And that's what the prosecution did. They used him to their advantage to try to make it sound like they have this case and all these horrible statements against Mrs. Crumbly. And by the way, when they presented evidence that Mrs. Crumbly is deleting texts and keep making it sound like she delect, selects different texts here and there, it actually sounds like Mrs. Crumbly deletes all her texts, as she testified, that when people start flooding <coughs> her with texts, she deletes entire threads at a time. Who knows what she's deleting? We saw her on her phone flipping through them super fast. Christy Gibson Marshall, the assistant principal who did do one of the bravest things I've ever seen, she testified she saw the shooter's face and couldn't believe it was him. And the reason she couldn't believe it was him is because it was so unforeseeable. And she's just doing each thing she needs to do as a hypervigilant mother. And yes, a hypervigilant mother can have a drink once in a while. I'm a hypervigilant mother, and I not only have a drink once in a while, but sometimes I've been known to have two or three or maybe a bottle. She's going to the gun range for him, not because she enjoys it. You can tell how much she loves it when she gets up there, shoots a couple shots, and then just stands there letting him enjoy the activity he likes. And I do the same thing for my kid. He likes to go to skate parks. I would rather do anything but go to the skate park. But I sit there and watch and say, oh, that was amazing. And all I hear is, mom, watch this. Mom, watch this. Mom, watch this. And I would rather do anything else. But Mrs. Crumley on that day is trying her best to bond with her child and have a relationship. Showing the pictures of the messy house was just not necessary. And the prosecution explained to you they weren't trying to prove she had a messy house, but much of it was just so unnecessary that I would suggest they are trying to make her look bad. They do kind of make her look a little bit like a hoarder. But if you saw picture, <coughs> pictures of my house right now, like a snapshot in time, you'd be just as horrified. I've been so busy getting ready for this trial, ready for all the fun we've had in the court and through these last few weeks. I still have my Christmas trees up. I was complaining to my husband the other day, oh my God, we still have our Christmas trees up. This is embarrassing. And he said, hey, Shannon, we still have ceramic pumpkins up. And I realized, oh yeah, all of our fall decorations are out too. And right now I have piles of laundry all over my kids over Christmas break put together stacks of stuff I need to take to the Salvation Army. Um, I have donations of my own that need to go. My house right now, if they did a search warrant today, would look just as bad as Mrs. Crumbly's, and it says nothing about me parenting my child. Reasonable doubt can be seen in the video when Mrs. Crumbly first sees her son at the substation. Her reaction to seeing him in this complete state of disbelief as to what's going on is to look at him and say, why, why? She doesn't look at him and say, I knew you were gonna do this. She doesn't look at him and say, see, I knew we shouldn't have bought that gun. She says, why, why? And when he says, take care of Dexter, she cannot believe that's her son and goes back into the other room with her husband and says, what the fuck? He didn't even care. And while the prosecution asked questions about, well, she's not sobbing and we hear sobbing and that's clearly James. James is sobbing. When you look at the video, if you decide you need to see it, Mrs. Crumbly is dabbing her eyes and wiping her eyes. And fine, she's not the crier some other people are. 
She showed sadness in the way that she shows sadness. And for these officers to get up on the stand and say, she didn't behave like the mother of a school shooter should behave, is nonsense. None of them have ever dealt with the mother of a child, who, a teenager, who has just killed people and shot many others. You can find reasonable doubt in the fact that the police officers are very, very biased in this case. There is no doubt this is one of the most awful situation any one of them have ever been involved in. But it's also very clear they have a narrative that Jennifer Crumbly is responsible, and when they came in here and took that witness stand, they were going to mess with me on questions that were so stupid. Like this ATF agent telling me he doesn't know if teenagers could lie. Everyone in the room knows a teenager could lie. That was a low ball. Just answer the question. I text, I am going to drive to my, drive home from my office right now. I'll give you a call in about 40, 45 minutes so I can get all of the bond factor information written down for you, for Marielle and me. I'm asking for bond information so we can go to the court in the morning. Your Honor, I'm going to object. There's a prior ruling. She cannot be a witness. That was already already dealt with. Sorry, I thought I was arguing off the evidence they admitted. Well, you can argue off, off the evidence. Okay. So they say at 7.37, okay, we'll be waiting. I'm going to call in one minute, okay. Then at 11.14 on the phone that both of them have been using, a text is sent to the lawyers, think we might have been found, don't know, just a heads up, please check. It's not for a couple hours that they're actually found, but Mrs. Crumbly testified she didn't send that text and she was already asleep. I am not standing here suggesting that James is guilty of involuntary manslaughter in any way, but it is important to find out, to point out that James was the parent responsible for all of the storage of the guns. Jennifer Crumbly barely knew a thing about them. She didn't object to them being in the house. She didn't object to buying the gun that James and Ethan were interested in. She didn't object to calling it Ethan's Christmas gift. She was not responsible at <coughs> all for the storage of the weapon. I am asking that you find Jennifer Crumbly not guilty, not just for Jennifer Crumbly, but for every mother who's out there doing the best they can, who could easily be in her shoes, for every parent doing the best they can, who could easily be in their shoes, for every parent that has snippets of text messages that could be read and make them look like horrible monsters. For every parent that has fights with their kid on text message that also could make them look like <coughs> terrible parents. At this point in trial, I always have to sit down, this is how the court rules work. The prosecution gives a closing, I give a closing, they have an opportunity for rebuttal, and then I don't get to say anything else. And I'm sure you can see from my demeanor in trial, when the prosecution says something that I know I have an argument against, I get anxious, I, you can see a reaction, and I'm not gonna do that, but I am gonna tell you that as they argue, I will have many things that I wish I could get up and say, that's not true, and argue again. So what I would ask is that when you go back in the jury room and begin to deliberate, you think about and ask yourselves, what would Shannon Smith have said in response to the rebuttal where they get the last word? I would just ask that you consider that in your deliberations, because I guarantee you I'll have a very hard time sitting here knowing that the prosecution gets the last word when I know the defense would disagree with it. And I am asking <coughs> each of you to vote that Mrs. Crumbly is not guilty because she is not guilty and because a not guilty verdict is the only fair and just result in this case. Thank you. Thank you.